Well, it's my pleasure to introduce today's Grand Round speaker, Dr. Bacando Fernandez. I virtually met Dr. Fernandez after we shared our joint interest in the discovery of biomarkers for ovarian cancer by use of mass spectrometry techniques. My research has been focused on the proteome, while his research is focused on lipidomics and metabolomics. So our new collaboration, which we just started last week, will involve the use of PAP tests from the University of Minnesota to characterize the metabolome. Professor Fernandez received his master's degree in chemistry from the College of Exact and Natural Sciences at Buenos Aires University and his PhD in analytical chemistry from the same university. In 2000, he joined Professor Richard Zare's lab in the Department of Chemistry at Stanford University. His work focused on several aspects of time of flight mass spectrometry with an emphasis on capillary format separation methods. In 2000, he joined Professor Vicki Wysocki's lab in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Arizona to develop surface-induced dissociation for gas phase peptide ion studies. Two years later, in 2004, he joined the School of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the Georgia Institute of Technology, where he currently holds the position of Associate Chair for Research and Graduate Training and is a Regents Professor and Vassar Woolley Chair in Bioanalytical Chemistry. He is the author of over 200 post-reviewed, peer-reviewed publications in the field of mass spectrometry, metabolomics, and analytical chemistry. He's also the academic director for the mass spectrometry cores at Georgia Tech, where he oversees numerous mass spectrometers. He has received several awards, including the NSF Career Award, as well as teaching awards and best (laughs) paper awards from several journals. He serves on grant review committees for NIH and the editorial board of several journals. His career current research interests include the field of metabolomics, and the development of new ionization, imaging, machine learning, and ion mobility spectrometry tools for probing composition and structure in complex molecular mixtures. The title of his lecture today is the, An Introduction to High-Resolution Metabolomics for Biomarker Discovery. So, uh, Dr. Fernandez, uh, you can now take over the Zoom stage and want to thank you again for speaking to us today. Thank you so much, Amy. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sounds good. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So apologies for being a few minutes late. I was uh, uh, waiting alone in in Zoom limbo, and that's just the reality of this new world we live in where everything is virtual and we we can do everything through the internet. So what I thought I would do today is um, to kind of like give you an introduction to metabolomics. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of metabolomics, but I wanted to kind of like break it down and and, and kind of like a, a, almost like a tutorial talk to just tell you what is it that you do when you're doing metabolomics and what are the challenges and what are the potential pitfalls. And as part of that, I was going to use an example of one project that we have that is funding by, funded by NIH that has to do with traumatic brain injury to to kind of like illustrate what you can do, what you cannot do at the end to expect. And no, hopefully you, you know, this will whet your appetite for doing metabolomics. So, um, you know, particularly my group is interested in metabolomics of disease. Uh, as you well know, better than I do, uh, disease typically is, you know, different forms of disease are considered of having, you know, contributions from environmental factors and genetic factors. And you can go basically from one extreme of diseases that are almost purely genetic to diseases that are caused almost, you know, purely by the environment, if you wish. Uh, the most complex diseases tends to be, tend to be the, the, the ones that are here in the middle where you have both genetic predisposition and you also have contributions of, of, of some environmental factors. And, and that's when you need to start using some omics tools to try to tease apart the, both the roles of the environment and the roles of the underlying phenotype. And you're going to hear me today talk about a, not just one biomarker, a, but really rather than one biomarker, panels of biomarkers. And the reason for that is that when you're talking about complex diseases, a single biomarker many times it's not sufficient 
to obtain a, a good diagnostic or a good screening procedure. So, you know, this is just some simulated data to illustrate that point. Imagine that you have a population of, uh, you know, healthy and diseased individuals and you choose biomarker A. And, and biomarker A, if you look along this dimension, the horizontal dimension, these two clouds of patients or individuals, they really interpenetrate each other along that dimension. So there's not a really good discrimination. When you look at these individuals in the center, biomarker A wouldn't be very accurate because it can't discriminate very well. And you could say the same for other biomarkers. Let's say you take a second biomarker, biomarker B, and those, those individuals in the center of this cloud wouldn't be able to be distinguished very well. But then if you combine A and B in a panel, and then you build a mathematical function using those two biomarkers. In this case, it's a very simple one. It's a straight line. You know, you could already tell by looking at this picture that this you know, straight line can actually discriminate between these two populations very well. And that's the concept between what the FDA calls uh, in vitro diagnostic multivariate assays. So that's a mouthful, but basically it's a long complicated uh, idea that, that says that, well, we can combine biomarker biomarkers in panels and mathematically calculate a scoring function that will discriminate between these two populations. So that's kind of like the concept. And the, the, the reason why this connects with metabolomics is that metabolomics allows you to measure many candidate molecules, and then you can investigate if combining them can lead to such uh, panels and such uh, scoring functions. So, you know, there, this comes with risks. And I, I, I thought that, you know, if you look at these two beautiful girls, these two twins, uh, you know, by all means, they're virtually identical, but you can find differences, okay? You can find differences. And if you look carefully, well, you know, they're wearing a different color dress and they're wearing different earrings, but effectively they are almost identical. So when you use omics to find biomarker panels, you have the risk of overfitting. And, and that is that the more variables you measure, the more likely you are to find differences just by modeling effectively noise. So you gotta be very careful. Uh, the more items you measure, uh, the more uh, you're likely to overfit your data. So it's important to really work with statisticians and bioinformaticians to make sure that everything that you do is done with, with the highest possible rigor. And you don't ask more from the data than the data can really tell you, okay? Because sometimes the data, is what it is. So let me just tell you what metabolomics is in case you, you've never heard of it. So metabolomics is one of the omic sciences that examines met alterations in the metabolome, typically in biological systems. The metabolome is really the group of molecules that are relatively small. Um, a cutoff is typically one and a half kilodalton. That's a little bit subjective. And that involves molecules that have to do with primary metabolism, what we learn in biochemistry classes, secondary metabolites. Those are very important in plants that could be signaling molecules, defense molecules. Uh, you can have molecules derived from diet. Uh, I always joke that every time you have lunch, you're changing your metabolome. Uh, molecules that have to do with exposure, that's the exposome. So if you live in an area that's highly contaminated, uh, your body will, will show that. So you know, if we analyze all our, all our blood, we all show, for example, exposure to what we call forever chemicals. These are chemicals that don't go away. And then you have molecules that are, that are derived from the microbiome, okay? So the microbiome works in a synergistic way with our organism, with the host. And then we see molecules that come from the microbiome and, and the microbiome can effectively change our metabolome. When I talk about metabolome, I'm also including the lipidome, which is the subset of the metabolome that contains the lipids. A, the advantage of metabol uh, the met metabolomics and the metabolome is that it really gives you um, kind of like the closest picture to the phenotype. And it's really what changes the, the, the most rapidly with different alterations such as the environment, nutrition, lifetime, disease, and so on. And it changes much faster than other ohms, like the proteome or the transcriptome and so on. Uh, as much as I would like to tell you that metabolomics, it's new, it is not new. Okay, metabolomics, you can find metabolomics paper that go, go back to the 70s. There's, a, there's a, here a reference to one of the earliest pro metabolome profiling uh, 
1971. But really what has changed is the number of metabolites that we can profile. We can profile thousands of metabolites. We can do that quantitatively. And we can do that in a very short period of time and in a very high throughput fashion. So um, all of that is tied to advances in instrumentation. So I will, I'll tell you a little bit about the advances in instrumentation and also advances in the bioinformatics component of this, of this field, which is, you know, involves uh, databases and so on. And, and you probably have, you may have heard of databases like Medlin or lipid maps and so on. I'm going to tell you about a, a, an example, which is a case control study. So we are basically going to be looking at, at injured animals versus uninjured animals. But you can also do a time result study or a longitudinal study. That is typically much more involved. It takes more samples. It takes more complex data analysis. But it can also be done. And I, I use the word biomarker in my title. title. I don't really like to use that word because for, for a molecule that to become a biomarker, we need to go through a pretty stringent process. Everything I'm gonna tell you about today is what we call the discovery phase. So we go in and we look at what molecules could potentially become biomarkers. But once you go through the discovery phase, then you need to go through another exercise using a specific type of metabolomics that we called targeted metabolomics. So initially we start with non-targeted, trying to build a hypothesis. And then that gives us some ideas of molecules that we can look at. And then we need to validate those by targeted metabolomics, several rounds of validation typically and until we can translate that to the clinic. And if you've been involved in biomarker discovery, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a pretty tedious process and many times it fails. And that's why you don't see a lot of new biomarkers. But I think that the promise is there. And sometimes for diseases that don't have good diagnostics, it's worth the effort. So um, this brings me to kind of like the core of my talk, which is to tell you about the actual metabolomics pipeline. Okay, so like any scientific study, you gotta start with a solid biological question. Uh, my lab, you know, we're a metabolomics lab. So we, we have been working on many questions. Amy mentioned that we are very interested in ovarian cancer. That's one of the questions that we've been working on for many years, maybe 15 years now. We've also done some work with prostate cancer. In, the terms, in terms of ovarian cancer, we're very much interested in finding biomarkers of early stage ovarian cancer. We've done some work with cystic fibrosis patients. We work very closely with Emory University. They have a, a very large cystic fibrosis center. I'm going to tell you later about some, it's not always disease. We're also working on some positive things. We're, we're doing a metabolomic study on uh, physical activity, what are the benefits of physical activity. But today I'm gonna tell you about a study that we published very recently that has to do with traumatic brain injury or TBI. And the question is, can we diagnose TBI? Can we do, can, what can we do for TBI? And um, some of you may have heard of this. I have a young daughter and I remember when she was a baby, we actually dropped her to the floor. She fell to the floor from a couch and we had to go to the ER. And we were very concerned because we thought that maybe she had a concussion. And I learned very early that there are no good ways of diagnosing TBI in a quantitative molecular way. So traumatic brain injury is a very complex disease. It's, the definition is basically it's some sort of injury or insult to the brain caused by an external force. It can be a fall, can be an accident, can be an explosion. So then in the military, this happens very often. Uh, you can have injuries that range from mild to severe, and they're very, very common, and they have a very significant economic burden for the country. Uh, but there's no effective treatment and no effective diagnosis. So uh, we've been studying traumatic brain injury for quite some time now. So once you have your biological question, you have to pay significant attention to how to design your study. And, and, and there's different approaches. You can go from a very controlled study, very specific, you can control the diet, you can control the sampling time, you can control the age of the individuals. And that is good because it's very specific, but the problem is that those biomarkers typically are only going to work under those specific conditions of the study design. So if you, if you look at individuals that are outside of those conditions, then the biomarkers may not work. 
you can also design an experiment that is more robust and you can try to include individuals with a, a, a larger variety of phenotypes, but you gotta be careful not to, not to bias the experiment, but, but by comparing you know, apples to oranges, if you wish, okay? So you really have to think about this very carefully. And, and once you think you're done with the study sun, think about it again. Because you know, garbage in, garbage out in this type of omics approaches. So if the experiment is not well designed and you have confounders that you didn't account for, those are gonna show up in the data set and that has happened to us many times. Uh, the other consideration when you're designing your study is the power, power calculations. And you know, we're used to power calculations in typical univariate studies, but when it comes to metabolomics, things are a little bit more complex because we're measuring so many variables. But there are uh, tools, for example, this is a tool that is built into the MetaboAnalyst package, that is a web-based package that allows you, using some pilot data, allows you to calculate how many samples you would need to reach an adequate power. What I'm showing you here is a curve for a, a study uh, that we are undertaking right now. It's a pediatric, pediatric Crohn study. These are uh, responders to therapy versus not responders. We collected some preliminary data and the preliminary data basically told us that we needed, you know, a minimum of 250 to 300 uh, patients per group. Uh, so, you know, 300 responders versus 300 non-responders to, to reach the, a, a good power. And that just tells you the, the cost and the scale of this type of omic studies. The larger the effect, the smaller the group size, as you would know, as, as normally happens. So this is our study designed for the traumatic brain injury study. Uh, we look at rats. In this case, we looked at both male and female rats because the literature talks about differences in differences in uh, uh, response or behavior in, uh, based on the sex of the animals. Uh, we, of course, you have to have controls. We call the controls, we call them sham animals. And then we looked at different uh, severities of the injury. We looked at one injury or three repeat injuries, okay? So the way that the injury is done is with a piston that applies an injury to the head of the rat, and that is controlled, has a control force, and the animals can recover from, from, this, from this injury. We collected data at a different time points, 30 minutes after the injury, four hours and 24 hours, because it's very well known that TBI has different injury mechanism. So you have a primary injury and then secondary injuries. And all this work is done with an expert in traumatic brain injury. So that's, I'm not an expert, who is my colleague and friend, Michelle Laplaca. She is in the biomedical engineering department at Georgia Tech. And the goal was to see, well, what are the differences, if any, between sham animals and the injured animals? So once you design your study, then you need to acquire the metabolomics data. And this is where the chemists really come in. And this is uh, quite complicated. Uh, my advice is that if you're going to go into a study like this, don't really overthink it because this is only one step in the study. So sometimes simpler is better. Uh, the, the critical step is decide how you're going to prepare the sample. In the case of the traumatic brain injury study, we were uh, taking blood from the animals and then producing serum. And uh, this, it's a critical step. It has to be done reproducibly. If it's not done reproducibly, you're going to see that in the data set. So if you're going to be doing this in thousands of samples, consider using some sort of automation. Uh, we, in our lab, have a pretty stringent quality control procedure. So what we do is we have what we call a quality control pool samples. I'm going to show you the results. That is just to compensate for changes in the sensitivity of the instruments that we use to collect metabolomics data. Uh, we also include reference samples typically in the studies. If we want to measure samples over several months, we can collect, correct for any batch effects. And the instruments are always tested for suitability before we do the measurements. And we have a long list of uh, parameters that we check before we run any samples. How do you acquire data? Well, there's basically three techniques in metabolomics, one which is the one that we use for the traumatic brain injury study is liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. It's actually a special type of liquid chromatography called ultra high pressure liquid chromatography. And that is what you are gonna see that people use in 99% of the cases in metabolomics. Uh, there's also other techniques. You can use 
a direct infusion mass spectrometry technique, or even more sophisticated techniques, such as something called ion mobility that is up and coming. And many people are starting to use that in metabolomics. But again, if the sample preparation is not done properly, garbage in, garbage out, no matter how fancy an instrument you have, the data is not going to be good and you're going to have to rerun your samples. The question of how to choose the technique, well, the de facto standard is liquid chromatography mass spectrometry that can be done with a time of flight mass spectrometer, can be done with an orbit trap mass spectrometer. There's different types of instruments. It allows you to measure tens of thousands of compounds. You can, it has excellent sensitivity. You can collect fragmentation information to analyze, to identify the molecules. But the problem is that it's relatively slow. It takes about 15 minutes per sample. It has expensive consumables. This is still cheaper than proteomics, but it's, it's, it's still expensive. So some people use other approaches. So you can use something simpler. It's a direct infusion approach uh, that doesn't use chromatography. But the problem is that you lose a little bit of information compared to this, the, the gold standard. Uh, ion mobility is an up and coming technique. You're going to see if you go to a, a metabolomics conference, you're going to see people talk about this. And it, it's useful because it gives you information also about the shape of the molecules, the shape of the metabolites. And that is useful in differentiating, uh, let's say, is uh, isomeric compounds, for example, if you have isomers. So this is a little bit of a sample data. This is the most common type of data. This is liquid chromatography mass spectrometry data. And what you have in the data set on the x-axis, you have what's called the retention time. This is the retention time in the column that is separating the compounds. And then on the second axis, you have the M over C, the mass to charge, which is really the, effectively the molecular weight in this case of the, of, the, of the molecules. And then the abundance on the C-axis. And you see a lot of abundant peaks. But you can, if you zoom in, you see a lot of very small peaks. And that is because the metabolome has a huge dynamic range. In the same way that the proteome has a huge dynamic range, the metabolome has a huge dynamic range. You go from millimolar to nanomolar. So you got to choose the threshold that you're going to use to, to, to pick your peaks, to what components you're going to look at. This is a, a pretty fancy plot. This is called the cloud plot for the liquid chromatography data. In, that we collected for the TBI study. So what you see above the horizontal line is the data for the injured animals. What you see below is the data for the controls. And each, you know, the black trace, these are the peaks. This is basically just the retention time dimension. These are the peaks that you see, all superimposed. You see that there's a lot of data. You see that the peaks have a little bit of jitter. So you are going to have to align them. And the bubbles, the meaning of the bubbles is the following. The darker the bubble, the smaller the p-value, meaning that uh, that is a, a peak that is really changing very significantly with injury. Then the size of the bubble tells you about the fall change, how much that is changing. So what you really want is you really want large bubbles that are very dark. And the green ones are peaks that are increasing with injury and the red ones are peaks that are decreasing, decreasing with injury. I hope I said it right. I always get it mixed up, but that's, so what this tells you is that there's a lot changing with traumatic brain injury in the blood of the animals, which is good news because we want to pick the best, the best metabolites to try to distinguish between an injured animal and a controlled animal. Some people, and, and us included, you can really go to town. I mean, if you have samples that are very, very precious, you can do a very in-depth analysis of the metabolome. And that requires more than one experiment. You can do different types of chromatography, and you can even include uh, other techniques like NMR. NMR is a technique that is used in chemistry very often, and it's a very powerful technique to identify and quantify molecules. And we've done this. If you're interested in a very in-depth metabol metabolomic study, you can go to this 2019 paper. This was a prostate cancer paper. And because the samples were so precious, we really decided to collect uh, as much data as we could. But careful what you wish for, because there is such a thing as too much data. And, and the, the, the postdoc working on this literally spent a year and a half analyzing the data from this study. So it was almost too much, you know? So we've learned the hard way that sometimes it's better to start with maybe 
one of the chromatographies and see if there's interesting information there, and then you can expand it to other types. Just to, to give you a snapshot, you can also, I told you about this new technique, ion mobility. Ion mobility is much faster than chromatography, and you can do this experiment in milliseconds. And the type of data that you get looks like this. So you have the mass to charge, the molecular weight of the metabolites. And then instead of the retention time, you have the drift time, which is measured in milliseconds. So this is a very, very rapid technique. And this is one of the appealing things about doing this experiment, but I'm not really gonna talk about this too much because this is kind of like a more advanced topic. So I'm gonna skip this and I'm gonna tell you what comes next. Once you acquire the data using, let's say, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, you need to process the data. And what I'm showing you here in the background is an actual spreadsheet for the TBI data. And you can see how this very quickly can become data overload because uh, you're measuring the abundance of the abundance of thousands of metabolites for uh, you know, in this case, you know, many time points and many samples. So it becomes a massive effort. And the steps that you need to undergo after the data is acquired is there's some kind of like housekeeping steps where you need to take each peak, you pick them from the raw data, you align them to make sure they're always comparing the same peaks across samples. There's a little bit of variation in the time. You group them into one compound and then you integrate them and you obtain the area under the peaks. So there is very specialized software to do this. Some of the software is open source and, and free. I'm mentioning a few packages here in case you wanna look at them, XCMS, MS Dial, all those are free. You can play with them. They have, there are some data sets online to play with them, or you can get a more sophisticated uh, commercial package. Uh, that comes built in with your instrument and that allows you to integrate all these peaks in a very kind of like very automated fashion. It's tailored for the specific instrument. So it works, typically works pretty well, but can take quite a bit of time. Like right now we're analyzing a data set that is being processing for 13 days in a powerful computer because it's so large. No matter what happens, just keep calm, know that there's light at the end of the tunnel that you just need to analyze the data and, and, and you're going to get there. But once you get that spreadsheet with all the peak areas for all the abundance of the different metabolites, now you can start with the fun part. And what by I mean by the fun part is really looking at the bioinformatics, at the statistical analysis. What you see here, this is a very typical first step. It's a principal component analysis plot. Each one of the triangles is one of the serum samples from the mice, and I'm not labeling them based on injury. So these are all of the mice. Typically, we start by looking at all of them and see if there are any points that are that could be outliers. Uh, the diamonds, the red diamonds in the center, those are our QCs, and we want the QCs to be all together in the center of the data set because that means the QCs are made by pulling all the samples. So they should be in the center of the, of the data cloud. And we don't wanna see any, any dispersion. If the data set has a problem, typically you're gonna see these diamonds walking in the plot in a certain direction. Finally, you see you have these squares. These are reference samples that we include with, with, the, with everything, just to make sure that if we, if we run this, samples later on, we want to rerun them, we can compare the two batches by correcting using these reference samples. And the reference samples can be, let's say some reference serum sample. They, they, they are, in this case, you see, they're quite different from the serum samples from the animals. This is because normally they are stored for longer time, so they show some differences. Uh, this type of analysis we do in different software packages. The best these days is to really teach yourself some Python because there's a lot of free Python, free Python uh, tools for doing this. But if you don't want to do any coding, the, the best way to start is uh, web-based tools like Metabo Analyst. Those are the lowest entry level. You teach yourself the basics and then you can move on to something else. But typically what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with doing unsupervised analysis by principal component analysis. And then we're gonna do some supervised analysis by other techniques. I'm gonna show you something called partial least squares analysis. 
And then once we do those basic steps, we can define, we can choose the best metabolites for answering our question. Uh, for the case of TBI, we detected a total of about 14,000, 14,000, what we call features. The features are the peaks, 14,000 peaks. So you see that we have a lot of data to work with, and uh, we need to tease apart which ones of these 14 we are really interesting, biologically speaking. And what I'm showing you here is a PCA plot, a principal component analysis plot of the TBI data with the quality control removed and with the reference materials removed. And the first thing that we saw is, for example, focus on, on the, these are the purple diamonds versus the green squares. Purple diamonds are female injured animals. The green squares are female sham or uninjured animals. And then what, the first thing that we saw is that the response is very different between female animals and male animals. We had, based on the literature, we were expecting that, but this was a very interesting confirmation. Nobody had really shown this before. So um, immediately what we decided to do is we decided to analyze female animals and male animals separately from each other. Otherwise, the main variance in the data set is male versus female. So the, that's 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 interesting, but we want to look at injuries based on, you want to look at differences based on injury. So let me show you what happens when you look at the females versus males differences. By the way, the peaks that we're using here is all the peaks that we had some sort of structural information for. The way that we annotate, we, the way that we identify the peaks is pretty complicated. I'm gonna show you that in a minute. So what you see here in A and B are showing you the, the, the data for the, uh, for the females, okay? And C and D are showing you the, uh, no, the other way around. A and B are the males, C and D are the females. So A and B, A is a PCA plot and B is the partially squares plot for the male animals. And you can see that there are differences between injured and non-injured. This is for the most severe of the injuries that we looked at, which is the 3X so three-time injury. If you look at this for the 1x injury, then the clouds are starting to interpenetrate because that is a very, very mild injury. It's like equivalent of you fell to the floor, you hit once, you know, it's not so severe. Uh, the difference between A and B is that A is unsupervised, meaning that we don't tell the algorithm to classify based, based on class. It just does it based on the differences in the data. Where in B, we do tell the algorithm what the classes are and tries to maximize the differences. You see some interesting things. You see here in, in the plot D, there's a square that is perfectly in the other cloud. So that is either a sample that is mislabeled or an experimental error of some sort, but there's something that happens. So, you know, we don't know. So we left it in the data set, but the data set will tell you right away when there's some sort of artifact, okay? So this is very powerful. We were very happy to see this because we can detect injuries between these two uh, sets of animals. The question immediately is like, okay, what are these differences biologically speaking? We know that we have metabolites that are different. We know that there's pathways that are probably different uh, changing, but what are these? And that's really where the chemists come in. Uh, you need to annotate, you need to assign a structure to the metabolite. And that can be done with different levels of confidence. So the most basic level is you can take the molecular weight of the analyte and you can search it against the database. The problem with that is that the, the answer is not unique. There's many metabolites with a similar molecular weight that can give you, a, you know, that correspond to different, different structures. And then you can start looking at other things like the distribution of the isotopes in the envelope, and you can do an experiment that is called a MS2, a fragmentation experiment, where you take the molecule and you break it apart. That is done inside of the mass spectrometer. And by measuring the size and the shape and of these parts, you can put the structure together. And in that case, the, the annotation is much more confident and you can tell what the metabolite is. Okay, so metabolites really range in a variety of structures. So that is uh, kind of like the daunting part of metabolomics. 
And that is one of the things that we spend most of time doing is figuring out ways of how to best identify these molecules. So just to give you an example, uh, depending on the type of uh, sample preparation that you do for your sample, in the case of the TBI study, what we did is we uh, uh, did an extraction of this a serum sample with a, a non-polar solvent. And in this case, most of the peaks that you're going to get are lipids. And lipids are particularly challenging to annotate because they have different chain lengths. If you remember this from your biogain class, they have chain lengths, different head groups, different double bonds, and different positions. And then you can annotate the lipid with different levels. So you can just annotate the composition. For example, this would be PC321 is a phosphatidylcholine with 32 carbons and one double bond, but you don't know how those chains are distributed and where the double bond is. Or you can go all the way to in-depth annotation of each lipid. So you're going to see that some lipids we can annotate be better than others, depending on, on the, the specific experimental data. So some results. This is the results for the lipids that were changing based on injury organized by lipid class. So again, this is, for example, the phosphatidylcholines, the PCs. And you see, so red is the time point immediately after injury. Green is the next one, blue is the next one. And what you see is anything outside of the black line is increasing, everything inside of the black line is decreasing. And you see that there's clear temporal trends over time, but you have molecules that are going up and molecules that are going down. This is not gonna be a simple one molecule going up type of thing. That's why I was telling you that we're gonna be working with panels. If you compare the three X injury to the one X injury, you see that as expected, the changes are much more substantial with the 3x injury, OK? And uh, we basically went in and we identified each one of these molecules in a very tedious way so we could map them onto pathways and get some biological meaning of what all, all this means. The way that we do that annotation is by fragmenting the molecule. This is for an, an example here. You see this is a lipid. It's a PS. PS is a phosphatidyl serine. And what you see is that as you break apart this molecule, you get peaks that correspond to the fragments and you can start putting together the puzzle. And we did this, when I say we, I really mean one of my graduate students. This was worked by uh, Eric Gear. He spent a good six months anno annotating each one of these peaks that we were finding to be important. And you know, these are some of the names, you know, for example, interestingly, one was Billy Rubin, okay? But we had a bunch of other ones and um, trying to annotate them so we could then map them onto pathways. And the way that you map these things onto pathways is typically you use some pathway analysis software where you can input the lists of metabolites and the, the changes. And then the software will look into the different pathways and tell you which pathways are significantly changing and so on. So what you see here is uh, this is using a, 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 a tool called Lipia. It's an online tool that you can use. And um, we put in all the important changes in the important lipids. And really interestingly is that we saw some of the pathways that were changing. One of the important pathways, not surprisingly, is a pathway called the necroptosis pathway. It's a relatively new pathway that has to do with cell death and inflammation. And considering that we're looking at traumatic brain injury, it's not surprising that that pathway is showing us as a, a meaningful pathway. But we also saw changes in pathways related to sphingolipid signaling, glycerophospholipid metabolism, and so on. So this is a lot of material that I can't go into detail because I'm going to run out of time. But it's just an example that you can really go. This is the keg. This is the keg plot of the necroptosis pathway that you can really go now into the pathways and start looking at, OK, this is going up, this is going down, and making some hypothesis of what is happening, in this case, with traumatic brain injury, and using that for follow-up studies. OK, remember that this is really the discovery stage. So far, what I showed you is results from serum. But you know, serum is really kind of collects information from the whole organism. So, Sometimes the changes that you see in serum are difficult to, to interpret because they're not really 
at the site of injury and you are really reflecting the, res the overall response. So you can also look at the brain, you know, what is happening in the brain directly. And there are techniques to look at the brain in metabolomics. One of the techniques is called mass spectrometry imaging. It's done with a specific type of instrument that is called MOLDI. The way that you may have heard of MOLDI, the way that MOLDI works is that we take a, a, a section of the tissue, a thin section of the tissue that we cut in a microtome. We put it on a microscope slide. We spray it with a, we coat it by a spray coating with a compound that we call the matrix. That compound typically is a compound that absorbs UV radiation. And this is what the slides look like. And you have the tissues. It's hard to see. So these are the outlines of some tissues. This is for a different study, not for the TBI study. And they're mounted on a stainless steel adapter. That's what goes into the spectrometer. The spectrometers can be very fancy. This is one of our fanciest ones. It has a very large magnet, a 12 Tesla magnet. And we mount the sample in the ion source. And what happens is that sample that is mounted in the ion source, we shoot a laser at different pixels. OK, we shoot a laser at different pixels. And we collect the data for all these pixels. From each pixel, you can get a full mass spectrum for all the different lipids. And then you select peaks of interest, and you can plot them as a function of x and y. And these are the type of lipid images or molecular images that you get with MOLDI. I'm showing you here is not for the type of traumatic brain injury study. This is for an ovarian cancer study, but uh, you get the idea. Each one of these images is a map of a specific lipid as a function of X and Y in this thin tissue section. What you're looking at here is actually an ovarian cancer tumor. Okay, this is in animals. Uh, so uh, the instrument that you use makes a big difference. So you, if you use a low resolution instrument, you may not see any differences in, so for example, you see this, this is the brain slice for, for a rat and you don't see any differences in no major differences in spatial distribution but then if you do it at a better resolution then you can tell apart that these molecules are actually mixtures of molecules mixtures of lipids that are localizing in different parts of the brain so let me show you this is not published yet but this is something that we're working on right now and um, these are brain sections for a sham animal and an, a 3x injured animal and this is the map for this lipid called the Lysopc 16-0. And you see that in an injured animal, there are many parts of the brain that show higher abundance, particularly this one. This structure here is called the corpus callosum. And this, that's a more rigid structure. And we see that there are significant changes of this Lysopc. And the reason why Lysopcs are interesting is because lysolipids are produced by hydrolysis of other lipids. So effectively, what you're seeing is the cleavage of lipids. And that is because of activations of specific enzyme systems following TBI. Uh, this is another lipid. And the, it's interesting because this is a phosphatidylcholine. So it's typically a membrane lipid. But this is the, the form of the uh, uh, phosphatidylcholine that is attached to a potassium ion. And you see how different it is between the sham and the injured animal. And that's because one of the things that happens in, the, in, in traumatic brain injury is that the ion pumping mechanisms across cell membranes are disrupted and changed. And you see very, very bright differences in ion distributions. So these are just two, two metabolites, OK? We have literally hundreds of these images, but these are some very striking cases that I wanted to show you. So you have an idea of how the traditional exper experiment in lipidomics can be coupled to imaging. So you could go and look for these lipids in blood or vice versa, look for some of the blood lipids in the brain tissues and so on. So to finish, I'm just gonna tell you, you know, a couple of slides uh, about uh, you know, what I think that the future looks like. And, and more than the future, it's the near future, really, because these are things that are happening. But we all want to know what comes next. So in the same way that you know, we would love to know what a cell phone would look like in 10 years, you know, it's something very sophisticated, probably. You know, what is what does omics look like in the future? So 
the, the answer to that is really that omics, uh, all the types of omics are really becoming one, one omic science. And, and that is the field of multi-omics. And I'm sure that many of you are familiar with my multi-omics. And the field of multi-omics is, or some people call it integrative omics or panomics. It's, it's really the field that merges information from different omics experiments. And that includes genomics, epigenomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, uh, metabolomics, lipidomics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can really go to town with this type of omics. And then uh, each one of these omics gives you part of the picture of what's happening. Uh, and then using very sophisticated bioinformatics tools, you can merge all this information and look at these from the network perspective in different tissues. So you can really do all the omics in all the tissues and you can even do that as a function of time. So the data that you generate is truly, truly big data. Uh, I am involved in one consortium called the Molecular Transducers for Physical Activity Consortium. What we're basically doing in that consortium is looking at the effect of physical activity and exercise from a multi-omics perspective. We all know that exercise is good for you, but uh, we don't necessarily know all the details of why it's good for you or even how to mimic the effect of exercise. If you have a person with a disability that cannot exercise, how can we help them to have the benefits of exercise without actually running a treadmill, for example? So this is a very large consortium. We've been working on this consortium for the last six months, uh, sorry, six years. And we have clinical sites, we have animal sites, and we are one of the chemical analysis sites located here in Atlanta, Georgia. And just to give you a flavor of what we're doing is we're looking at the effect of um, exercise in rats, for example, different ages, different, different sexes. And um, we are harvesting uh, up to 20 different tissues and each tissue and collecting those as a function of time. And each tissue is subject to something in the order of 25 different omics platforms, ranging from genomics to lipidomics and metabolomics. We, in this consortium, we do all the lipidomics work. So the data sets are very large. If you wanna see a description of the consortium, uh, you can look at this, this, is this paper that came out in Cell, talks about the consortium, how it's organized, all the platforms. But that's just to tell you that, you know, the future looks like multi-omics and, and uh, the challenge is gonna be the data. Uh, how to analyze these massive amounts of data. So I'm gonna finish right here. This picture is actually very fresh. We took this on Monday uh, fall in Atlanta is beautiful. And you can see that we are all without masks outside, but we are, we are still being careful. So I wanna thank Amy again for the invitation to speak here. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to, to working with, with her team. Thank you very much. Great. Okay. Well, I'd like to open this up for questions. If anyone in the group has um, has uh, questions, we could take them now. I, I would just like to ask a quick one about the different types of samples that you've analyzed. So most of your talk was about serum samples from the rats and then the, some of the brains, but are there other sample types that you've analyzed that, um, and then how do you how do you have to modify your protocol to do these? Yeah, we, we've analyzed all sorts of crazy samples. So we've looked at breath, we've looked at cells, we've looked at urine, we've looked at tears, we've looked at the, probably the craziest sample that we ever analyzed was blood from a whale shark. That was very weird. Uh, and all, they all require a slightly different sample preparation protocol. Uh, one that is pretty challenging is adipose tissue because a homogenizing and pulverizing and extracting adipose tissue can be a little challenging, but um, it's doable. It's doable. Um, the, we are, I didn't talk about it today, but you know, we're trying to do single cell metabolomics. And that is something that is a little bit sci-fi right now, but I think that in five, 10 years, it's going to become routine. So it requires very specific technology, but we basically do it on, on all types of samples. Um, some of our favorite samples are urine. You know, that's a, a good one because it's a little bit cleaner than serum. 
Uh, you know, we started working with you on the pap smears, which is not something that we've done before. Uh, so it was really interesting. We had a long discussion internally on all the things that we could do about with that type of sample. What else have we done that is pretty crazy? You can do hair. You can definitely look at hair. You can do images of hair. You can put a single hair strand and do moldy on it. So yeah, I mean, it's it's you know, there's a lot of different things that you can do. Hey, great. Uh, it looks like Dr. Crossan, are you? Do you have a question here? Uh, yeah, thank you, Amy. Uh, Dr. Fernandez, that was a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. I, I want to add, I was very intrigued by the studies on TBA that you were doing. I want to ask if you've done any studies in humans with TBA. And the reason I'm asking this is that we have a safety net hospital in uh, Minneapolis uh, that already has a research uh a uh, uh, program set up to look very carefully at TBA patients and, and following them. And, and as you know, this is an extremely uh, important issue because many of these patients go on to long-term uh, uh, long uh, uh, brain uh, dysfunction. And so it's really Im important to be able to follow them and identify the ones that are going to get long-term problems. Have you done any work in, in humans with Yeah, uh, thank you, John, for the question. So we've done some, and, and, and the, the challenges are humongous to do work with humans. Um, so we, we, we did a study for, for three or four years, a study with uh, high school football players. And we, you know, this is something also connected to Amy's question. So we looked at saliva. Uh, you know, nobody, nobody wanted to take blood samples. So we ended up having to look at saliva. And the problem was that the samples were very heterogeneous. So we saw some changes, but nothing significant. I would be very interested in connecting with this network that you mentioned to, to, to try to look at a, a more systematic sampling because we, it's, it's a question of, uh, you know, designing the experiment very carefully. So, uh, so we've done some work with 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 pigs. Actually, you can do TBI studies in pigs. That's a little bit closer to humans. But no, the short answer is we don't have good studies in humans yet. And uh, we would like, we would love to, we would love to. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll I'll check with the group. At the, that would be great. Center. Yeah, we 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 definitely have interest. But the the one study that we did the last few years didn't didn't show any, I mean, there were differences, but the number of samples was too small and, and the statistics were not convincing. So, you know, we, we, I, I don't like to publish things that are borderline. Yeah. Yeah. But, but in, in this situation, of course, we would have ready access to serum. Samples. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. I see uh, where is, I'm trying to look for hands up, but I see uh, Stephanie Thomas. Do you, do you have a question? We have your microphone was off for a second. Now I've lost you. No? Oh, Stephanie, you there? No? <laughs> okay, there we are with Todd M. has the hand up. So I will give it to you. Uh, he might be muted. I can't hear you. Hmm. Oh, okay, Todd, mute. can you unmute yourself? I always joke that that's the 2020 phrase, you know, you're muted. I think so we, we, we all said that a million times in 2020. Hello? Okay, we have lost Todd. <laughs> I have his microphone on. Yeah. So I am unsure of so maybe anybody we'll go else to, with questions. We'll go to the Mr. BG, whoever that Bartek. is. Oh, Bartek, you okay? <laughs> oh, hi. Uh, this is Bartek Ziva. I'm a hematopathologist. I was wondering about the uh, possibility to do metabolomic studies from formal in ticks paraffin embedded tissues possible mm -hmm. at all and otherwise how do you preserve 
cells of t or tissues for future experiments. Yeah, uh, so um, it is possible, but we try not to, uh, because the, the paraffin and the embedding material really, really interfere with the measurements. So our, our favorite way of preserving tissues is simply flash, freeze, flash freezing. So that's really our, our favorite way of doing it. So short answer is we'd rather not. <laughs> but you know, if you have like you know an incredibly precious sample, you, we can try, right? If you have like the one, but but we it's it's possible, but it, we'd rather not do it. So flash freezing for a uh, sort of solid tissues. How about uh, cell suspensions? Yeah, we, we you can basically take the cell suspension, put it in the minus eighty, and then we'll take it from there. You know, we'll we'll do the. Um, We'll do all the sample prep that, that is needed. Typically, we need to centrifuge, remove the supernatant, um, wash, and then extract the samples. That's the way we do it. And then the, in terms of numbers of cells, uh, if, if, if we can, we would ask for something like a million cells per sample. If that's too much for the study, we can go down to, you know, a hundred thousand, fifty thousand, even less. But the lower the number of of cells, the less coverage you get, right? So it's going to be a compromise between the the two. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Should we try Todd again? If you can, uh, we're not hearing him. Okay. He's unmuted, but. Maybe his microphone input is not what he's using. Yeah. Well, I'll just ask another question. In, in proteomics, there's a way to, if you see those big peaks that are like these highly abundant proteins, there's some way to like subtract them out or choose not to have them show up. I was just wondering in when you're doing metabolomics on these things that are, you know, less than 1.5 kilodaltons in size, is there some way to get rid of those super high peaks that are- Yeah, 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 there? yeah. It's exactly the same than in proteomics. You know, at the at the core, the two, the two omics, proteomics and metabolomics, they both use mass spectrometry. So a lot of the same tricks that you do in proteomics can be done in metabolomics. Yes, you can, you can pick and choose, you know? So, and sometimes those very abundant peaks, you really, so one of the, one of the challenges in proteomics is that serum has, very abundant proteins, right? Like, like seven or eight proteins that are super abundant. So what many people do is they, they do a depletion of the serum using antibodies just to get rid of those, those particular proteins. Uh, in metabolomics, you don't need to do that. It's, it's definitely cheaper and simpler. Uh, you can do that at the data analysis stage. So even if those metabolites are present in the data, you can still basically ignore those signals effectively. Okay, you can ignore those signals. So you can work with the data set directly and say, hey, I'm going to focus on this part of the data set and any, anything that is too abundant, I can, I can remove for now. You know, so uh, yeah. Uh, and, and the problem with very abundant metabolites is that they many times they saturate the detectors, right? So they're so abundant that they just maxing out the detector. And, and that's a part of the data set that is less reliable and you can just, remove we don't we don't need to look at it yeah okay sounds good and i don't know if bartok has another question or if his hand is still up from before so no okay all right hand down all righty well i guess uh if there are no more questions we'd like to uh thank you so much for giving us this grand rounds presentation and it was very very educational for all of us that i the majority of the people here are pathologists and some of them do mass spectrometry some don't so it's just a well it's, it's great it's, opportunity I think, uh, the lines between the fields they're slowly becoming blurred you know and exactly. everybody knows a little bit of everything these days yeah we right. enough enough to be dangerous you know enough yeah. to yeah. <laughs> okay but well, i appreciate so it amy again for the invitation very much Say, can like, you can you hear me right oh, now? yes yeah no, oh, so okay. really quick dr Fernand. so you know you were alluding to the challenges of annotating yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah yeah in mass spec right so one of the the big problems with metabolomics is there's not this false discovery rate 
you know, calculation really. And so do you guys have a way of handling that or you're just relying yeah, on? Um, so you're, you're absolutely right. So in proteomics, you have very powerful ways of, of estimating right. the FDR because you can use decoy databases. Yep. You know, proteomics effectively lives with, a, it works with an alphabet that we know what it is, right? right. We know the amino yeah. acids, we, we can scramble the sequences, we can calculate the FDR. It, no, there's not a comparable way to do so in metabolomics, no. Um, are, are you using like, do you have custom databases that you get, so you get like specific fragmentation patterns yes. on specific instruments? Yes, that's exactly that's exactly what we do. So um, we over the years, we have built a local database yeah. that is effectively, we, we, we've done this manually to give you an idea. There's a specialist, yeah. you know, it's a, a chemist with 20 years of experience looking at the data and confirming the structure of the, of the specific compound. And that is a very, pain, very painful work. And, but, yeah. you know, we have our own database in, in at Georgia Tech that we've created over the years. There are public databases. You know, there's one, for example, it's called Mona. Uh, yeah. but, but, but like, you know, I, like your face is telling me, you know that these databases are yeah. what and, they and are. There's papers you know? out too, right? That the bigger the database gets, the more false discovery you're going to get. Right? Absolutely. Which, so, like, like the Medlin database, you know, it gets bigger and bigger, but it's just, it's a challenge. That, that's of how do that's you, exactly you know, true. So, you know, when I was, so it depends on what stage of, so, you know, if you look at a, a yeah. very basic annotation, a level five annotation, I, I basically yell at my, at my students. I was like, do not assign a name based on something that yeah. is a level five. We do not yeah. put those names on a slide because people immediately, when you name a molecule, they, they start making hypotheses, right? So right. And this, is, this is not reliable. When you're at this level, you cannot really say much. As you go down, you know, as you get to something like a level two, typically yeah. we like to be at a level two or better. Yeah. As you get to a level two, I think that you can breathe easy and you can be like, look, um, if it's not this molecule, the way that I have it on the screen, it's something that it's very similar to this. You yeah. know, it may be something that is so connected. Yeah. I, I've, I've seen where you can create and you know, these fragmentation sort of yeah, energies, yeah. right? Where you do different fragmentation to, to try to look at at least the species of the molecule, right? And kind of track it exactly. down you're not getting exactly. a hit, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You can do very a... sophisticated things. You can, just to give you an idea, uh, you can take a molecule, you can fragment into chunks, and then depending on the type of instrument you have, you can then take a fragment and further the fragment the yeah. fragment MS right so end, yeah. ms to the end yeah, so yeah. but you know i gotta tell you i you know you know i don't know if you can see that one of the bullet points here is nmr so people yeah. that look at new drug molecules you have to isolate it and you have to do nmr okay, so if you really want full annotation that's where you're going to have to go you know but it, it's not always necessary to go that deep you know, only if you really have a marker that is so promising that it's worth the, the effort, you know, um, and yeah. we don't do it for everything. So we typically stop at something like a level two, level three, and then we see if it's necessary to go deeper than that. You know? Yeah. Let's say, you know, Amy and I find a biomarker that we are fascinated about. Well, then we'll throw the kitchen sink at it, right? Yeah. But, but, but only for a couple of interesting peaks, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but you probably don't work in this area because you're asking the yeah. right question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I work in a mass spec facility, so. Okay, so you know yes. what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah, so one of the challenges is like what IDs do you give to people, right? Because you, in the end too, even when you have MSMS, sometimes you have a uh, I, of I agree. IDs and it's like, what do you give these people? I, I you know, I we spend a lot of time educating our collaborators, just telling them, look, careful yeah. what you do with this information. You know, like don't, don't take it too far. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, you're right. Yes, you're right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again. And thank I you. guess based on uh, all those questions now, we can uh, wish you good luck in your studies. All right. Thank you, Amy. Nice chatting okay. with you guys. Okay. Bye-bye.